Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to Deep Learning System Algorithm Implementations. So how time flies. We are getting close to the end of this lecture series. So today we're going to cover a slightly different topic that is also quite relevant or putting uh, machine learning model into practice. And it's a topic called model deployment. Okay, so up until now, we have learned a lot of the machine learning uh, models and the uh, you know, system building techniques. And today's focus is going to focus on more on you know, the techniques we can use to accelerate and also deploy our learned machine learning models on different kind of environments. So to begin with, so far we've learned about a lot of things. Right? We've learned about how do we build automatic differentiation libraries um, from scratch and uh, also you know, derive the end-to-end -end reverse mode autom autom automatic differentiation. On top of that, we are building a uh, how acceleration library and the needle library that allows us to be able to compose up the different kind of modeling techniques that's different modules and make use of compositional capabilities to build different kind of models. Uh, we also learned about different modeling techniques, including you know, feed-forward neural network, generative modeling, sequence modeling, in-place model, and so on. And we have also looked at different kinds of optimization, normalization, and initialization techniques. On most of the cases, we learned how to build a deep learning system that train deep learning models efficiently on a standard computing environment. Because that computing environment involves GPU that help us to be able to run uh, a lot of accelerations in here. On the other hand, we also need to consider the question about deployment. Specifically, so imagine that we have an existing model that is learned uh, by our needle framework or you know, pick your favorite machine learning framework, PyTorch, TensorFlow, or others. Um, you will be able to get a learned model. And the task of model deployment is that we want to be able to bring that model onto uh, different kind of environments that we might want to be interested in deploying it onto. Of course, it could involve you know, deploying them on the same environment, like a server environment, in which case we could directly go ahead and use Needle. Um, sometimes you know, we might be interested in deploying uh, face detection aggregations or other aggregations onto mobile devices. In other cases, we might be interested in deploying our machine learning model onto smaller embedded settings. And even for GPUs, uh, you know, right now there are different kind of GPU environment that we can use, right? So we will have uh, NVIDIA GPU, AMD GPU, Apple GPU, and uh, there are other GPUs in mobile environments as well. So the question about model deployment effectively means you know, how can we bring those learned models to different application environments. Now, if we pause a bit and start to think about what are the possible difficulties in bringing our models onto learning environments, if I pose that question to you and let's think a bit about what are the complications behind, you can find that there are quite a lot of interesting things we want to consider. For example, if you want to deploy things onto, say, a, a mobile device, right? We will need to be able to wrap our machine learning models onto a native deployment environment. For example, if I'm going to run our Apple devices, at least I will need to be able to invoke the system libraries on the Apple environment. In order to make use, say, my GPUs on iPhone, we will need to make use of Apple's GPU program language, in this case, Metal, to do so. If I want to deploy things onto an embedded settings, uh, like a Raspberry Pi, we will need to be able to make use of the acceleration libraries on, in this case, ARM environment. And uh, on embedded settings, usually memory is also a concern, so we want to be able to reduce our memory consumption in this process. And of course, you know, if you want to deploy things as a mobile app, there's also a question about can we minimize the library or application size, where right? you don't want to deploy your your overall execution libraries as you know 200 megabytes of application. So that's also another concern of you know, being able to reduce the dependencies. And in certain cases, the deployment environment may not have Python. 
That means effectively we can no longer use some of the Python dependent implementations in our framework. So although deployment seems to be you know straightforward in some sense, for example, if I just take the needle library on my uh, on, on on the server, right, on on Colab, and just want to use that to do predictions. Uh, likely, you don't need to change anything. You can just use needle out of the box, or you know, if you are using PyTorch, it's the same thing. On the other hand, if I start to think about the complications of, about deployment on different environments, certainly you know there are more things to consider beyond the things that we have implemented so far. A lot of that are being borne by the diversity and characteristics about the deployment environment that we're going to face. So we have already walked through, you know, some of the considerations. I'm going to bring and go through those points again. So the first four, when we are doing model deployment, we might need to consider the application environment restrictions. In this case, it could be the size of models that you can you can choose. In other cases, a lot of cases, you might be running on environment that don't have a Python interpreter. So we need to be able to find ways to get around that. Uh, in a lot of the modern platforms like uh, mobile devices or other devices, we might have a local hardware acceleration. Uh, for example, if I'm using an Android or Apple device, you will have a mobile GPU on top. In a lot of cases, there will be accelerated CPU instructions like ARM's new instruction or you know, uh, AVX instruction in Intel devices. And in other cases, there might be specialized hardware, like neural processing unit, that we can go ahead and leverage on. The other side of concern is that we want to be able to build our overall um, deployment solution and integrate them with the application. Right? So that means that we will need to be able to have ways to do things like data pre-processing to transform say my video streams using some of the transformation primitives. Uh, if, it, if it involves you know, some of the tabular data, maybe you want to do feature engineering, and also post-processing to be able to take our prediction and turn it onto something the application understands. So all of these things kind of uh, are complications that are being bored by deployment. So now let's start to take a look at what's the current typical way of running machine learning deployment. So nowadays, there are a lot of the deployment engine or in inference engine available out there. Those inference engines are usually you know, specialized. You can view them as a specialized frameworks that takes in uh, a deep learning computation and you want to be, they will be able to take in that and be able to run some of the end-to-end -end inference computations on a particular device. Um, so I'm going to leave list a few of them. For example, on the NVIDIA devices, there's a uh, NVIDIA have a tool called TensorRT that allows you to be able to give a, a computation graph to accelerate some of the computation for you. If you are uh, looking at some of the embedded devices, there's this tool called TensorFlow Lite, or ARM have also have this tool called ARM Compute Library that specially implements and optimizes some of the computations on embedded devices. By looking at Apple devices, Apple have a framework called Core ML and that allows you to um, build machine learning models and it will be able to leverage both the GPU on device as well as the neural engine that is um, comes with the Apple uh, Apple Apple SOC chip. So the way that uh, most of those deployment engine works is that they're going to take in some kind of the, what we call inference model format that uh, describes the overall neural network computation for, for inference. So, so in this case, usually there are kind of different uh, model formats that are being recognized by the inference engines. For example, there's a one common format called Onyx Open Neural Network Exchange, which is quite widely used. Um, by Microsoft and a few other uh, entities. And it's a format that allows you to describe the overall neural network computation. Apple also have its own format called CoreML. And uh, uh, TensorFlow 
uh, come with you know TensorFlow-like format that you can use to be able to build things onto. In this case, I think it's a flat buffer uh, format that describes a computational graph. This so will be able to take that and build up the end-to-end -end computation. So most of those formats kind of well internally what they do is, is some format that describes the computational graph and a weight. So effectively, you know, if I have a two-layer neural network, likely this uh, format is going to look like something like your input. Uh, it's going to describe a sequence operations that we're going to carry out to run this inference workload. And it's also going to attach the weight of each of the stages in here. So usually, the, in terms of deployment, what we need to do is we want to be able to take our learned model. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's been uh, written right, in another module format. And find a way to be able to generate the corresponding computational graph format that our deployment backends might want to take. Of course, it, it does come with limitations in the sense that, you know, um, in a lot of cases, when we are building a neural network, remember that we are building these uh, using needle. Right? And one of the advantage of needle is that our computations kind of have a dynamic computational graph construction. So, and we are, we are constructing a computational graph on the fly at each of our iterations uh, of, of computation. So the advantage of that is we will be able to you know, mix the computational graph construction with the Python code. Right? So imagine that you know, if we want to have some advanced uh, model strategies, for example, we could, there's this um, idea called stochastic depth that allows you to be able to randomly skip some of the residual net connections during training time. Right? And uh, if you want to still do the stochastic depth on a deployment end, it's really hard to describe that stochastic depth as a whole computational graph. There are other cases where some of the um, output of a computation, uh, some of the uh, computation can depend on the output of a previous computation. For example, in certain cases, like a mixture of experts, we might want to use a neural network to decide which, uh, which of the following uh, sub-experts they want to be able to query. And in this case, uh, also, it's possible to describe it in computational graph using like uh, conditionals node in here. That certainly puts a, a, a bit more pressures on you know, what kind of the computational graph format that we're going to give. So in some sense, in a lot of cases, that's not a very perfect model format that allows us to be able to describe everything. That is, that, that's also the reason why it creates a bit of trouble on you know, effectively deploy models written in PyTorch or Needle. But on the other hand, it's also kind of like a blessing in the sense that, you know, uh, the flexibility, right, of the PyTorch and Needle in terms of being able to uh, do a lot of computation in Python kind of enables us to be able to build those models more effectively. And we do need to recognize that most of the models that we're interested in will be able to, actually, that are being deployed on real-world scenarios will be able to be resented as this computational graph format. So still, you know, if you want to be able to build and, uh, and run those models on different environments, having abilities to be able to get the computational graph is going to be useful. The techniques that uh, framework that PyTorch is using is they usually use what they call a symbolic tracing, a tracing technique that effectively traces through the overall computations, you will be able to obtain the computational graph, right? That, that is in our internal format. In this case, the format can be a needle format that, uh, that we use by connecting the values together. And now we can build a translator that translates that needle format onto the computational graph that backhand engine recognizes. So if you are interested, this could be also one of the project options of you know, maybe take a needle model and deploy that on environments like Onyx Runtime or TensorRT or other runtime. So that's about how we are going to get a learned model and turn that on to a computational graph format that the backend recognizes. Inside of the inference engine, most of the inference engine that we saw today, like TensorRT or TFLite, 
have been structured as a computation over interpreters. The idea is that it's going to you know, allocate intermediate memories for this computational graph. It's going to walk that through using topological order. So you're going to walk through the first layer, run a computation, get the result on the first layer, and then it's going to run the second layer and so on. After it interprets each of the step in the end, it's going to be able to give you the final output and you're going to get that final output as your prediction. So one of the, uh, as I noted in the, in the last slide, right, so most of the inference engine do have a limited set of operators supporting programming models. So depends on how powerful they are. A lot of cases, they may not support things like dynamic computations, or in certain cases, maybe they would even require other shapes to be, to be known ahead of time. One of the things that a lot of the inference engine do very carefully, though, is through what we call a, a memory reuse. So we have already mentioned that in some of the past lectures, that if you're doing inference, there are a lot of opportunities to reuse memory. So instead of allocating the memory uh, each of a time, most of the inference engine will be able to you know, pre-allocate the memories and uh, using a scratch pad. So for example, in this case, we could say that I'm going to allocate A for here, A for this node, and I'm going to use two, uh, I'm going to share the memory of relevant softmax in here. Of course, besides those basic memory allocations and optimizations, there are other optimizations that most of the inference engine do. Um, some, some of them could involve things like an operator fusion that takes uh, two operators and turn them onto a single operator. And then some of the inference engine might also convert the intermediate weights and the act activation to a, a lower precision drawing points, like uh, you know, FP16 or so. So these are like possibilities of you know, how those inference engines are going to implement the underlying computations and uh, accelerate the underlying computation as well. Okay, so that's all about overall inference engine. And then moving next, I'm going to cover a relatively emerging topic. This topic called the machine learning compilation. Okay, so up until now, uh, if we look at the inference engines, most of the inference engines are uh, library driven. That means that for each kind of hardware backend, in order to build an inference engine for that particular hardware backend, we need to go ahead and build specialized libraries. And uh, indeed, take a lot of engineering effort to do optimization, especially go and build that library kernels for the particular hardware backend of interest. So usually, if you find out if you look at each of the inference engine, that's usually an engineering team and a big company that's supporting that. TensorRT is being supported by NVIDIA, TensorFlow Live is being supported by Google, and CoreML is, is being supported by Apple. Okay, so that's usually a set of engineer that keeps optimizing and implements the libraries for the particular hardware backend. So of course, it can be quite engineering intensive. So one of the questions that uh, the field is asking recently is that is it possible to bring a bit more automated techniques? So instead of trying to build a library uh, for each kind of hardware backend, can we try to go and do some form of direct code generation that takes in high level machine learning models and turn them on to directly runnable code on uh, each kind of how our environments of interest that, that hybrid environments can include the embedded environments, a GPU, or sometimes even accelerated environment. And this is the OR field is called machine learning compilation and still an emerging field. And it's also one of the field that, that I personally do research in. So it's kind of a quite fun thing to look at a lot of the recent advances in here. But the general idea is, you know, maybe you want to be able to do a more structured code generation. Uh, of course, sometimes we, so we still want to be able to offload some of the computations to libraries, but the idea is that we not only want libraries, we also want to be able to complement that with the code generation approach. So what does it mean to do a machine learning compilation? Um, let's start with you know, how we can go and represent the machine learning program in a typical ML compiler. So normally, um, a typical machine learning program can be represented what we call um, what we call a module in here, and usually the machine learning program could contain things like 
functions and the cost between functions cost in this case uh, we have a model right in this case this describes a one layer neural network that contains x w and and the soft max in here right so this is the one layer neural network that uh, that is like a, a single soft max classification neural network that we've been describing here and usually this format called also called intermediate representation so so that's the terminology in compiler or you know the the ways we can use to represent the intermediate uh intermediate code that that is in a compilation and uh, this box is called an IR module and it contains a collection of interdependent functions. Another thing to note about most machine learning models is that each of the intermediate uh, data in here, right, are higher dimensional tensors or multi-dimensional arrays. So effectively, you can view that, you know, it's not that different from a computational graph that uh, we described before, right? except it, it's slightly more generalized in some sense. You know, the functions correspond to can correspond to the real program functions that you write. And the intermediate data can just be, you know, tensors that uh, we are looking at. So one of the things that most of ML compilers do is we'll try to take an IR module that represents the computations, the usually a tensor computation that correspond to the original model, and trying to do a sequence of transformations. So that will bring the high-level model onto something that is directly runnable on the target environment. So for a given machine learning model, let's try to walk through what a possible ML compilation pipeline could look like. So for a given machine learning model, first of all, you know, we are going to import that model from our native framework like PyTorch or Needle into this uh, intermediate IR module that uh, we can use to represent this particular machine learning model. In this case, you know, it's a one layer neural network that contains the X input weight bias, matrix modification operation or bias add, and a soft max operation. One of the things we can do after we have those IR modules, we'll be able to run uh, higher level transformations on this module. For example, we could try to take um, in this case, I could try to take this part of the computations and try to turn that on to a single dot add function on the right hand side. So this is a transformation usually called operator fusion that allows us to be able to fuse the computations of subregion of the computation graph on, our, on the left hand side, in this case this part, onto a sub independent function. One of the motions we can do moving next is we will be able to actually take these fused functions and, for example, generate a single operator that, that does the you know, matrix modification and add in a single GPU kernel. As a result, it was going to save the overall uh, GPU computation memory in this case. Besides this kind of like a, you know, operator fusion, there are also other kind of transformations you can do on the computation graph. For example, in certain cases, if we have normalization, right, in the, either layer, either batch form or other cases, we will be able to turn that normalization onto a shift and a, a scale and add operations on original computation. There are other cases where we might be able to, you know, transform the layout of the data. So, especially in convolution neural networks, we know that you know there are different ways to lay out data. You can put the channel dimension on the high list or put the channel dimension on the low list on different kind of hardware platform, they might have different implications of the overall execution efficiency. So we'll be able to uh, do transformations on, on those higher level computational graphs. There are other possible transformations you can do. Uh, in certain cases, sometimes we maybe we'll have parallel, uh, we'll have like parallel passes that allows us to be able to run, you know, parallel uh, matrix modification. So we'll be able to fuse what we call doing, a, a, in this case, doing another kind of fusion to be able to fuse some of the parallel passes together into a single frame. So in some sense, you know, if we have this 
higher level computational graphs, we will be able to do transformations in different ways uh, on this on this what we call a high level representation. Once we have done some of the higher level computational transformations, one of the things that um, a lot of ML compiler to do is trying to lower, or in this case, you know, be able to translate part of the computation onto something that is slightly lower level. So in this case, one thing we can do is we can translate the right hand side, the dot add part, onto what we call a loop loop nesting representation and the advantage of this loop nesting implementation is that it's getting closer to the underlying hardware so we'll be able to write things in a for loop and in certain cases we will be able to run what we call loop nesting transformations to be able to generate and uh, transform a loop nest in a way such that it kind of fit onto the underlying hardware backend so um, and uh, you know, once we have this loop nest, one of the things you can possibly imagine that I could go ahead and directly translate that on to uh, you know C Howard, or in certain cases maybe I could even translate that onto CUDA, CUDA on media devices. So the loop nesting IR is a way for us to be able to generate the underlying um, underlying code, accelerated code on the underlying hardware. Once we are in the loop nest and transformations, one thing we could go ahead and do is trying to do some of the lower level transformations. For example, one of the things we could do in this case is uh, operator fusion, right? By trying to fuse the bias uh, operation onto the initial assignments uh, of Y in here. Back. Uh, we want to try to fuse. So in this case, you can find that this is a loop nesting addition. We can try to recognize that there's assignments here. We could swap the bias set, right? So we could try to do the bias assignments first before we do the matrix multiplication operations. So this is kind of like a lower level loop transformation we can perform. And depending on the kind of transformation you perform, you might get different execution efficiencies. And that's where some of kind of like automated cogeneration approaches come in to become helpful in this case. So once we have this transform a lower level loop, finally, one of the things people will do is we'll do cogeneration. So in this case, this lower level loop will become a compiled operator on my runtime environment. And of course I could you know, have a softmax a compile as well or provide a predefined library implementation of, software, of softmax, okay? So in this case, Besides these compiled operator functions, we could also have some representation that help us to be able to uh, interpret the computation. So a lot of the uh, generated result will have something you know, higher level. In this case, you can find that it describes overall computation. Right? So it will effectively means that we're gonna take in X and W and B, invoke this dot add function, get the result, and invoke the softmax function, and get a result in here. And finally, the final output is gonna be the output of our runtime execution. So effectively, this is our overall runtime environment, and it's the final artifact that the compiler outputs. Depending on the approaches, that could also be you know approach that directly turn into this graph, turn this graph interpretation onto something that is you know fully compiled. So you could also Turn, for example, this function onto a fully compiled C plus function that invokes each of the particular operators as well. So up until now, we have walked through the possible life cycle of an ML compiler. So we'll be able to take in the higher level machine learning models and and do some transformations or high level intermediate representations, lower some of the parts onto what we call loop programs, convert loop program onto a compiled operators. And then finally, on the runtime environment, being able to take in this composed compile operator and the overall computational graph and do end to end execution in here. Of course, one of the questions that people can come and ask you know, is how is it different from the original um, 
inference engine approach, right? In some sense, they are not that different. So if you look at this final format, you can find that this could be the format that inference engine takes as well. For example, most of the inference engine do come with this computational graph part, as well as a, a set of predefined operators. One of the key characteristics of most ML compilers is that sometimes some of those operators will be generated automatically from this intermediate implementation. And so on one hand, you can view like a ML compilation as an approach to enable you know, efficient model deployment. And uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of techniques we talk about today are being incorporated onto ML deployment solutions, such as TensorRT and other cases. Of course, the compilation techniques also do not limit to inference work. So we could also imagine that we can go ahead and bring the same techniques to accelerate some of the training workloads as well. To recap, we know that you know, in, throughout the compilations, um, there is a layer called higher level IR, or usually people also call it computational graph IR, because you can usually look at them as kind of like a computational graph in some sense. And each of the node is a tensor operator that takes in some input tensors and output certain input tensors. And uh, we can go ahead and transform these intermediate implementations to, to represent things like operator fusion. In other cases, we can also go ahead and annotate this uh, combinational graph. So, you know, we can annotate things with decisions like device placement. Most of the machine learning framework also have this layer. So in some sense, you can find that this higher level IR is also baked onto most of the common machine learning frameworks out there, including Needle in some sense. You, know, you can view our uh, Python, Pythonic computational graph information as a way to represent this higher level IR. Now let's dive slightly deeper onto uh, the topic of lower level code generation. So in terms of lower level code generation, the goal here is we want to be able to uh, effectively take a high level operator, like for example, matrix multiplication, and want to be able to generate a different variants of low level programs. One interesting thing that you have learned in our lecture of power acceleration is you know that you know, different ways of ordering loops and, uh, and computations can have a huge impact on the execution efficiency, right? So for a same high level specifications, like for example, if I specify my result as, you know, this transpose matrix location in this way, it can correspond to different variants of low level programs. We could do things like operator tilings, uh, loop tilings that we did in some of our um, uh, hardware acceleration lecture, right? We could directly write out the vanilla loop. In certain cases, we could have uh, what we call hardware intrinsics that correspond to some of the operations that get accelerated by online hardware. So we could generate a lot of lower level program variants for a given high level program. And one of the questions that, that we want to answer is, you know, how can we effectively search over different variants of low-level programs and find the optimal implementation for the particular hardware backend. So let's have a look at you know, what are the common elements that a low-level loop plantation can have. Of course, it's going to have multi-dimensional buffers that's going to represent our multi-dimensional computation uh, storage for our intermediate results. It's going to have multi-dimensional loop nets and of course, the array computation in here. So in order for us to be able to explore different possibilities of optimizing the same program, of course, one way is we can just go ahead and write down right, different variants of programs. For example, we could try you know, different ways to tile the loop uh, a bit using register tilings and cache line tilings we talked about in our past lecture. Another way to try to optimize this program through what we call a loop transformation. So in this case, the idea is we have, we have a code and we all have, also have an APIs on the right hand side that go and manipulate the code on the left hand side. For example, this is a pseudo code that I have that usually represents a transformation API. So in this case, 
it's not get loop x i'm going to split the loop at this operations the effect is that it's going to take the original loop you can find it's going to split x onto o and i part where the inner factor four is coming from here so you can find that the loop nest on below is exactly equivalent to the loop nest on the top, except that we're using you know, two loop nesting to represent one loop. Of course, if I do plot here, right, it's not that different in a sense we're still doing the same forward iterations, except that you are just using two iterators than the one iterator. But things become interesting if you start to do compose it with more operations in here. For example, we could go ahead and say, let's go take this code and let's try to do reordering of the loop. Now in this case, after reordering, what's going to happen is that it's going to reorder these two loops in different ways. Right? And after you reorder it, you can find that actually this corresponds to a different way of iterating on the data. Of course, not all the loop net transformations are possible. And this transformation really depends on the fact that we are running a data parallel computation here, where each of the element computation is independent from another. So we'll be able to, you know, do the loop transformations and do it order. We can also try to turn it onto a GPU program. In this case, what we can do is we can go ahead and take the reorder program, and we're going to say I'm going to bind go and XI onto thread and block index. Remember our CUDA programming model, right? In CUDA programming model, the block and thread index correspond to the index of a thread within a GPU stream multiprocessor and the global index of, of the overall thread block within that uh, overall launching group. So if we bind it, you can find that you're going to get a pseudo code like this where, you know, effectively become a GPU kernel and uh, the sys operation can be create, create correspond to where XI being binded onto the, uh, on where XO is being binded onto block index and XI is going to be banded onto the strategy index. So effectively this is XI and this is XO. And remember, you know, XO is binded by strat index and XI is being binded by block index. Okay. So one of the fun things you can, you can find is that by running transformations of our original program, we turn the original program that runs on, well, usually if you have a for loop, right, you write it down, it only runs on CPU, but it turns it onto a GPU kernel that you can really go ahead and launch on CUDA. Isn't that amazing? So through the program transformation it allows us to be able to transform the program and turn it into something that effectively can execute on GPUs. We could use a similar approach to generate different variants of transformations where each of variant of transformation correspond to uh, a different implementation of the program. Some of them can be more efficient than other ones. So then comes to what we call automated program optimization. The idea is that we want to build a ML compiler that tries out different transformation sequences in here where you know we could try out for example i could instead of doing four here i could try out eight and then in this case it will become eight by 16 right and so that will generate different variants of programming here and i want to be able to do an end-to-end -end search of possible implementations of a, of a machine learning operator so here is kind of like a high level overview of what an automated ml compiler will do so the idea is that we'll try to generate a search space. And then the search planner is going to give you different configurations in here. Each of the configuration is going to help us to be able to output a code. So in this case, X corresponds to a generated variant of a program. One of the things that a lot of the um, automated programs doing is they will do what we call auto-tuning, automatic benchmarking. So once we have this program, what we are going to do is we're going to send the program onto a target environment. In this case, say I have a mobile device, I'm going to go ahead and do and measure the execution time of that particular runtime kernel on the particular device we are interested in, in this case, Raspberry Pi. Once we get a measurement, this measurement data is going to be used as training data to learn the estimation cost model. So in this case, 
the estimate cost model is going to take uh, existing configuration and estimate how accurate, what is the running time of that. So effectively, we don't have to try everything on a device. Instead, as we collect more data, the mobile-based cost model is going to be able to tell us how effective our configuration is. And that really helps us to be able to reduce overall search time and find a good configuration for a particular hardware. One interesting thing about this approach is you can find it's fully automatic. So in some sense that, you know, if you take an original program, you don't need to worry about how do you go in and optimize the code on a particular hardware backend. Instead, as long as you have a decent stress space and a decent ML cost model, it's able to give you a decent generated code, right? And use that to be able to, uh, to, be able to build a better overall cost models and make use of a cost model to run better future predictions. So by, by through this process, actually, you know, we reduce, we kind of replace this of the human engineering effort by the automatic compute time. And in certain cases, we know that it's really hard to train expert engineers. And this automated approach really helps us to be able to automatically find uh, different kind of variants of optimized program on a hardware backend we're interested in. We could also apply it onto different hardware backends. So, you know, you could apply it on one variant ARM GPUs, ARM CPU versus another variant and uh, get, uh, you know, optimizations for each of them. Okay. So to summarize, we have learned about uh, ML compilation and automated ML compiler. Uh, there are more elements that we don't have time to talk, talk about today. For example, we roughly talk, talk about how we can represent the program. And there are different ways of representing a program. Some of them could lead to more efficient optimizations than other ones. That's the question about how we can build a comprehensive search space through a self-transformation that covers common optimizations. And also how do we find ways for domain experts to provide inputs right through this process. And, and finally, how can efficiently optimize the search process so that we can reduce the overall uh, search space and, uh, and find a good, uh, find a good set of, you know, program candidates that we can optimize on. So all these are exciting topics that uh, is still actually ongoing research in a lot of cases. And uh, if you're more interested, you should go and check out uh, some of recent literature. Uh, I also had another online course called MOC.AI that, that explains this automated machine learning compilation topic. If you're interested in your model, also welcome to check it out. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture. Thanks everybody for coming, and I will see you in the next lecture.